Born in 1891, Zora Neale Hurston is considered one of the legends of 20th century American literature. A literary star of the Harlem Renaissance, Hurston has influenced such writers as Ralph Ellison, Toni Morrison, and Alice Walker, among others. Literary critics of the 21st century have celebrated her use of the vernacular and her scholarly study of folklore. A contemporary of Hurston's, Robert Hemingway, remembered that she, quote, helped to remind the Renaissance, especially its more bourgeoisie members, of the richness of our racial heritage. Hurston was raised in Eatonville, Florida, the first incorporated all-black town in America, and was advised by her mother to ambitiously jump at the sun. This video excerpt explains the importance of Eatonville in Hurston's life. I do not belong to the sovereign school of Negrohood who hold that nature somehow has given them a low-down dirty deal and whose feelings are all hurt about it. No, I do not weep at the world. I am too busy sharpening my oyster knife. Zora Neale Hurston journeyed deep into the South with a camera and pen in hand, recording Negro folk culture. She wrote countless books, plays, and articles infused with the rhythm of her people. Zora's fame would come from one book, Their Eyes Were Watching God. But throughout her life, she was legendary for her spunk. She was bodacious. She was outrageous. She enjoyed shaking things up. She's a Southern black woman who wants to be a scholar and a writer, living in a white world of letters. And that was one thing I liked about her, her independence. She didn't care about you and what you thought. Zora could go from dialect to the most beautiful English that you could possibly imagine. It was like music when she spoke. Zora was kind of feisty and kind of raunchy. She could tell you to go to hell and make you enjoy the trip. The Florida village where Zora grew up was a special place that had been created by and for black people in 1887. Eatonville, the first incorporated Negro town in America. A Negro town? You mean the whole town without the white folks? Nothing but color folks? Who bosses it then? They bosses it themselves. Kirsten makes a great deal out of growing up in an all-black town, a space where she could have her uh, uh, creativity blossom, have free reign with her imagination. Eatonville was sort of the touchstone that she came back to all the time, and she always came back to Eatonville in terms of writing. Eatonville, the city of five lakes, three croquet courts, 300 brown skins, 300 good swimmers, two schools, and no jailhouse. The Negroes set up their hastily built shacks on St. John's Hole. The Negro women could be seen every day but Sunday, squatting, washing clothes, and fishing. No more backbending over rows of cotton. No more fear of the fury of Reconstruction. Florida offered Zora's parents an easier life than they'd had in Alabama. But the promise of a world without racism for their eight children is what kept them in Eatonville. Her father was three times elected mayor of the town. So even in the 1890s, she has this anomalous experience of being able to go around and say, I'm the mayor's daughter. 
As a teenager, Hurston left Eatonville for high school in Baltimore. Hurston later studied anthropology at Barnard College, where she was the only black student, and at Columbia University in the mid-1920s. After graduation, she returned to her hometown to conduct anthropological studies. The data she collected would be used both in her collections of folklore, but also in her fictional works. Herson is best known for her 1937 novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, and she is also praised for the folk tales she collected in Mules and Men, which was published in 1935. However, Herson wrote many short stories, which are also admired. Perhaps the three most anthologized are John Redding Goes to Sea, her first short story, which was published in the Howard University literary magazine, The Stylus, in 1921, and then Spunk, which was published in Opportunity in 1925, and Sweat, which was published in Fire in 1926. These were important publications, and Hurston's stories won her respect from writers of the Harlem Renaissance. And in 2020, fans of Hurston have been excited because a definite, definitive collection of Hurston's short stories appeared. Hitting a Straight Lick with a Crooked Stick is a collection of 21 of Hurston's stories written during the Harlem Renaissance. The two stories that I typically include on my syllabus are Sweat and John Redding Goes to Sea. In Sweat, the protagonist is D Delia, a hardworking, tough woman who withstands the physical and mental abuse poured out on her by her husband Sykes. The ironic ending is satisfying for the reader, and many critics have celebrated the story of a portrayal of a strong woman. John Redding Goes to Sea was Hurston's first published story, so it perhaps doesn't have the same polish of her later work. What makes this story so interesting is, as critic Melissa Dennehy points out, is Hurston's implied attitude towards the migration of Southern blacks to the North and elsewhere. Although Hurston herself left Eatonville to go North, John Redding Goes to Sea can be read as a cautionary tale about misguided hopes. John's mother implies that the social and economic promises her son is searching for are empty promises. In Hurston's stories, we often see that racism is not just a Southern problem that can be escaped by going North or even setting off for an exotic life at sea. Hurston was a complex figure. She was brilliant, she was vibrant, she was a scholar but she embodied some traits that seemed to be contradictory. She was, as her biographer says, quote, flamboyant yet vulnerable, self-centered yet kind, a Republican conservative and an early black nationalist, end quote. Hurston fell out of favor in the 1940s and 50s, and many credit Alice Walker for reintroducing the reading public to Hurston in the 1980s. Walker's essay, In Search of Zora, was published first in 1975, and then included in Walker's famous collection of essays, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. She set off the Hurston revival. Moved by the fact that Hurston had died in poverty without even a grave marker, Walker erected a tombstone on which he had inscribed, quote, Zora Neale Hurston, a genius of the South, novelist, folklorist, anthropologist, 1901 to 1960.